Good evening, everyone. This is Brother Smith, pastor of First Gospel Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. It's good to be with you again. This is <clears throat> on another broadcast. We're trying to get used to this. I don't think we'll ever get used to not being in church together, but hopefully, hopefully it won't be too long uh, before we'll be able to get back to some measure of normalcy. I see that uh, our president and uh, others are at least talking about <clears throat> trying to remove some of the restrictions of mitigation. And so hopefully um, in the near future, we'll, we'll be able to uh, remove some of the restrictions. I'm sure it'll be important that we um, or, you know, still maintain some uh, distancing, social distancing, and, and uh, probably it's going to be a trial and error. I said last week this will, um, it'll be, there will be some good come out of this. They uh, are medical professionals and, and um, uh, <clears throat> officials, <clears throat> different departments, they will, there will be development come out of this that will help us in the future, <clears throat> you know, more testing, treatments, vaccines, and I'm sure there will be development that will help us <clears throat> in the future with any other scare of a pandemic. <clears throat> we'll be more, more prepared than we were for this one. So I'm sure, as I said, there'll be some good come out of this. Anyway, I, I'd just like to say grace. How did Paul say it? Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to be with you again this evening and um, appreciate everyone that uh, has been <clears throat> watching and, and getting online uh, it is uh, Brother Painter in our church who's in charge of our media. Uh, he does post this on our website, and I also post it on my webpage so it can be watched later for those who may miss it or miss part of it. Anyway, um, the last few Thursday nights I've been talking some on uh, been talking about the end of the world, the sequences that uh, are going to transpire or what sequence events, prophetical events are going to transpire before the end comes and <clears throat> of the end, to, end, end of the Gentile world. So um, I'm, I'm going to continue that tonight. Um, you know, I have, um, I've talked some about what, what is going to transpire up to now because I think it's important for the saints of God to realize that, that where we are in God's timetable and um, what is yet to take place and, and what order or how it's going, or what's going to take place and some of how. And so... Uh, might, I might say a little bit more here tonight um, about <clears throat> uh, the two-horned beast in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelations. There, there's, uh, I'll just say this, that uh, before the end of this world, the church will have to be restored. God will not judge, ultimately judge, eternally judge until there is a restored church and the full measure or the fullness of God's manifestation is presented to this world. Judgment first must begin at the house of God, Peter declared. It'll have to happen down here again. Um, it's important for us to uh, know the truth. There's many truths that have been established and and uh, come into knowledge, but there are still some 
things that we're not together on as a ministry in the body of Christ that we're still working on. And, um, you know, so I always try to tell the saints here locally under my ministry to, uh, some things I tell them, if they're going to write notes in their Bible, write it in pencil. There's other things I tell them, you can write this down in ink. <laughs> As there's some things that have been established, but um, um, especially uh, things it, that we're not together on, those are areas that God's going to help have to help us um, uh, get a little more refined in and understand in a clear way so that what we put out before the saints of God is uh, complete and true understanding. Um, right now, you know, we're doing the best we can do. And I, I always say that, you know, especially when it concerns timetable, I, uh, I for one, have uh, done quite a bit of studying on trying to understand what time we are, how much time we've got left, and uh, reckon the scriptures, prophetical scriptures on time. However, I've always been quite fearful about, you know, putting a date on anything. I've seen it done many times since way back in the 80s where men were wrong about it. And, uh, you know, and, and saints would get ready and, 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 of course, trust their ministry. And, and then, you know, that, that maybe it would be missed, not intentionally, but, but the dates would be missed. So I'm always careful about that, realizing that there could be some things that God hasn't revealed yet. But I think, that someone ought to be working on it. And someone who God's dealt with in prophecy ought to be those that are working on it. Uh, everyone is not called to do the same job in the word of God. There's men that's called in areas I'm not called in that are much better than I am in those areas. And so, uh, you know, I think we all have to work in our calling and, and um, you know, what God's put on our heart and what message God has gave us. Anyway, um, so, you know, as far as timetable, I will tell you this, that the best that I can, my position right now on time, the best that I have is that, that the church will be restored and completely in 2033 and be the last prophetical hour of 15 years would start at that time. That's just my position on time. I'm not, you know, I'm I'm not uh, a stickler about that. My mind is open. I'm listening and and uh, I'm considering anything else that uh, maybe where I could have missed it. But I do know if we're looking at two thousand year days, you know, two days in the Antediluvian world, two days or two thousand years, a thousand for a day. In the Jewish world, that would put four days. I mentioned Sunday how that, you know, Lazarus being in the grave four days and being resurrected by the Lord Jesus Christ was a picture of uh, life, of the resurrection being established after 4,000 years from the fall of Adam. Um, and of course, Jesus himself was the uh, first man that resurrected from a fleshly state to a celestial or divine state uh, with eternal life from the fall of Adam. That happened in that 4,000 year period or that four day period that, that Lazarus was a picture of. Um, and since uh, the day of Pentecost was approximately AD 33, AD 33 and a half, uh, if you took a 2,000 year Gentile day to that, I've got a different way of going about it that has a lot more detail to it, but just uh, <clears throat> the short synopsis of it. If you add two days or 2,000 years to 2033, you'd come up to 2033. 
um, uh, it comes out the same as if I go through other dates detail wise. Um, but then there's a 15 year prophetical hour that will take place after that. Um, so I would just say this, that we, you know, and that would put us in 2000 years in the antediluvian world or two days and 2000 years in the Jewish world or two days, which would be four days. And then 2000 years in the Gentile world or six days and God finished, you know, his creation he, in six days and the seventh day he rested which the, <clears throat> the millennium would be entering into God's rest, the thousand year millennial reign. So we have to know that we're somewhere close to the end of the Gentile world. We would, you know, uh, we, we would be uh, foolish not to consider that somewhere we're getting close to the end of this world and we ought to be preparing ourselves for it. Uh, I left off last week <clears throat> talking about the two-horned beast in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelations because this is one of the things that will have to transpire. Um, first, I said the church will have to be restored. And then <clears throat> uh, for that to happen, uh, there will be much, much transpire in a quick order after that. One thing is, is that during that time of the 15 prophetical hour, 15 hours, uh, God will judge Babylon. And, uh, and of course, the word Babylon and it means confusion. Uh, we have a great picture of the children of Israel being seven year, 70 years in, in captivity of Babylon. And they finally got out of Babylon and went back with Nehemiah and Ezra and rebuilt the temple. And that's a picture. Uh, God's people in, in type have been in a Babylonian religious uh, state. In the Gentile world, all of this confusion of different organizations and different uh, teachings in Christianity that has separated God's people <clears throat> cannot uh, that that cannot be God's order in a restored church. Uh, we're not going to have uh, division. The early church is our picture, and that's our foundation. Um, we're built on the foundation of of the law and the prophets. Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. And so we know we have to line up to that early church. And so uh, it's, it, it's going to take us having what they had back there in a complete understanding, plus the power of God and manifestation of the spirit to accomplish what was accomplished back there in that, uh, in the end of the Jewish world. And so <clears throat> Babylon will have to be judged. God will have to get his people, all of his people. There's a lot of God's people <clears throat> in this world in religion that God will get them out of that. Just like in the end of the uh, Jewish world, there were people in different secular groups of Judaism. And those people had to come out of those secular groups out from under the law and come into the body of Christ and receive Christ, uh, their Messiah and, and their Savior. And they had to get an understanding of God's purpose and what it would take to inherit eternal life. The full understanding uh, came through the ministry of the, uh, the, the body of Christ ministry apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Uh, in the end of that world, under Christ, the headship being the head of the body. And we'll have to have an order like that with a complete understanding so that we're not confusing, separating or dividing 
God's people. And so that'll have to transpire. And then we will have to judge, you know, we'll have to call God's people out just like those early apostles. They harvested that world. When I say harvested, I mean, they went through that world preaching and teaching with the power and demonstration of the spirit of God, the truth about Jesus Christ, his purpose and God's plan, his eternal purpose and plan uh, for his people to inherit eternal life. And the Jews had missed it. They had divided with secular groups like Pharisees, Sadducees, Elamites, Herodians, uh, Essians, and many other different uh, secular groups back there that divided the people of God in the end of the Jewish world. They called those people out of all of that into the true church. I've said many times that uh, the United States is not the body of Christ. God chose the United States to restore his church in uh, fully, to fully restore his church in. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not because the United States is, is not a nation that is built by men who are stronger, wiser, you know, greater men than any other people in the earth. It's because God had our forefathers come here in the fear of God and build uh, this nation uh, under God's uh, leading, uh, a nation that was under God and fear of God. And our forefathers even uh, saw to it that there was a division between church and state, a separation that, that there would be a civil government that would take care of civil matters, but leave the church alone and let God order his church through his ministry and do the work that he had to do. Our forefathers in civil government realized that was not their job and they held the church sacred and they feared God enough to give God room to work and do his work while they maintained order in the world. And God has blessed this nation above every other nation. And this is where the gospel's been built and carried out throughout the world. But so much has still yet got to transpire. And I would have to say and admit that the United States is nowhere near is close to God, our God-fearing in, in our government officials or even in our people as they once were. Uh, God will, you know, he's, he's building his church just like in the early church, you know, under Rome, under that beast system. Uh, the church was certainly the minority, but God gathered everything out of it. That's what I'm calling a harvest. He gathered everything out of it that he could gather out of it and made up a portion of his bride in it. That will take place down here. And so yet there's, there is a calling that will have to call God's people out of all of this conglomeration of, of religion in Christianity. I'm not talking about other religions, but anyone, you know, that that could hear the call of God is certainly the, the door is open for God's people, whosoever will let him come and eat of the tree of life freely. So, but God's dealing with primarily, he's dealing with his people uh, in Christianity. And he will, he will gather his people out of all of that before his bride is fully made up they'll have an opportunity to hear and see a full manifestation of God's truth and be called out of everything into one body. That's what we've used as our cardinal chapter in the New Testament is Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Uh, it starts off where Paul says, I, the prisoner of the Lord, 
beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation or with your call with lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. He starts off like that, that we uh, have to keep the, we have to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit, the bond of peace, that is to be peacemakers and to keep our spirit uh in unity with one another. Even though we may not agree, we're still brothers and we're still trying to stay together while God is working and helping us to find areas uh, in his purpose that we may have missed or been ignorant of, unlearned of. And uh, so we're having to endeavor and it takes it takes lowliness or humility. It takes meekness uh, for that to be accomplished. And so, uh, and, but he goes on and says there's one body and one spirit. That's talking about the spirit of the body, which is that we take on the spirit of Christ and the body has a, it, it has a spirit different than any other spirit. The spirit, uh, the spirit of the body of Christ, it's a different covering of the spirit of Jesus Christ. We, the more we come lacking, the more our spirit and the more we, uh, our spirits become together. Like uh, in that in Proverbs, we said uh, wisdom has, has uh, built in her house. And, and it, says in, it says there that she's mingled her wine. That's talking about we've mingled our wine or our spirit, not only with each other, but with Christ. We're learning how to work with him. We're learning how to work together. And so there is just one body. There was just one body in the early church. Everything out here that's calling itself the body of Christ I'm sorry, but it's just not. If, if you separate my arm from my body, it's no longer a part of the body. And if you have a body of people that separates and has no connection with each other, that's not one body. That's several bodies. There's several different bodies today, and they're not the body of Christ. There's just one body of Jesus Christ, and it's being formulated um, it's coming together. It's, uh, it's being developed, having that one spirit. And then he said, there's one Lord and one faith. There's just one faith. You know, you can't, you know, I've had people ask me, what faith are you of? Well, there's more than one, just one. There, there's more than just one faith even in Christianity in this world, but there's not but just one faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, one true faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It takes the truth of God's word uh, for us to have true faith, the true faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to have the truth. And, and so uh, there's just one father, one God, uh, God and Father who's above us all and and through you all and in you all, he said. Until this all to, is to happen until we come to the unity of the faith. And so that's what we're working on. Uh, so we not only have to gather God's people out of Babylon, uh, but then then judgment is gonna transpire. There's gonna, there will be a judgment now in the, in the end of this world, there is uh, where we are going to have a dragon system again. And so I'll take up where I left off uh, last Thursday in the thir 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, talking about this two-horned beast that's in Revelation 13, starting with the 11th verse. 
It says, I heard an, an, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly, he, uh, deadly wound was healed. Uh, so there's going to be a, a two-horned beast. I, I, I said last week that horns in the Bible uh, in prophecy are powers. And the two-horned beast, uh, there's, there's, there's several reasons that I equate this two-horned beast as being the United States of America. Um, if you notice, it, it comes up out of the earth. Uh, if you look in the 13th chapter in the first verse, John said, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns and upon his horns, 10 crowns and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. So here, this seven horn, this seven headed beast came up out of the sea. Now, the sea in, in prophecy is talking about the world. It's, it's talking about uh, peoples, nations, and tongues. Uh, the angel describes that in the 17th chapter of John. So <clears throat> these, this seven-headed beast are seven world powers, dragon powers. Uh, if you look in the second verse, it says, the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Okay, well, if you, out of the seventh chapter of, of Daniel, uh, these, these beasts are mentioned, the leopard, the bear, the lion, and then a terrible beast. Here it's called the dragon. Uh, the leopard... It, it goes backwards. See, before the dragon, here the dragon is, is Rome. But uh, if, you, if you go, uh, uh, the, the leopard was, was Greece. Uh, the bear was Medo-Persia. If, if you go from Rome backwards to the leopard, then the bear, meat of Persia, and then Babylon. And so <clears throat> out of the sea or out of the world, these dragon powers, which is world powers, and for them to be a dragon power, it takes the union of a religious power and a civil power. Once a religious power and a civil power come together, it forms a, bra a dragon power that rules the world during its time frame, during that portion of its time frame, the dragon portion. Egypt was the first world power, then Assyria, then uh, Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, and then Rome. Uh, and of course, the seventh head, is the head that we're talking about here. When he gets through talking about this, um, in the 11th verse, he begins to talk about this, another beast coming up out of the earth. It didn't come up out of the sea. The earth here in prophecy is talking about religion. See, the United States didn't come up out of the world. It was not evolved out of these other dragon powers. The United States of America escaped dragon power of Rome and it, and it came to America and set up a country, a free country, free of worship and free to seek God and serve God uh, without being forced in a, with a dragon force. And so they set up a, a, a liberty in the United States of America and it was two horned. In the beginning, it was lamb-like, two horns like a lamb. 
Our civil government was lamb-like, had no intentions of being anything but creating a, a, a government where people had liberty and freedom. Freedom from a government that forced them, just a government that would maintain a reasonable uh, law system that would maintain peace and order. All the while allowing God's church to work in liberty and develop freedom of, of, of choice, freedom of worship, and not being for, having force put on them. God did that. God set that up in this country for the purpose of restoring his church. But these two horns were like a lamb, but finally it speaks as a dragon, a world power. The United States of America is, I believe anyone would agree with me, it's the strongest country in the world today. And, uh, you know, it, I think it will become a stronger country than it ever has been. Uh, and I think that it will... Uh, have to, it's had to police the whole world um, uh, for many years now. And uh, when, whenever it begins to force the world, nations, to pay taxes or Amish, you know, force other nations to, to pay for all this policing that we've done. And uh, that's already been, it's already been proposed to uh, the United Nations. And so it's a possibility, but before it's over with, it will, it will necessitate a religious power to work together with it, to have the force that it's going to need to be able to control all of the things that's happening in this world. See, democracy I feel God uh, helped man to develop democracy. It is a temporal order. It's not God's true order. God's true order is theocratic. It's a theocracy where God's in control. Democratic orders where the people are in control. And <clears throat> But I can see why God did that. I see how while the church was being restored down through the Reformation, uh, people had been done so wrong and so and forced so much that I believe God allowed them to set up a an order in all of these different churches where the people had some control. Uh, you know, it wasn't Bible order where you would have uh, an order in a church where the people would vote in a pastor or vote him out. Um, you couldn't have voted Paul or Peter or James or John or any of those apostles out of their churches. They did that. God's order wasn't set up that way. But because of man's confusion, you know, the red horse, which is a picture of of um, Pentecostalism, uh, when the church fell out of the white horse state into a red horse state. Uh, the rider had a sword in his hand and he had power to hurt men. The sword is the word of God and men without wisdom can be hurtful. People can be hurt. There's victims that, you know, have been hurt. God is aware of that. Uh, God's correcting that, but he also has to understand, God understands that, you know, one time God dealt with me and told me the men you are working under are the greatest men that I have. They're not fully developed. It's not restored yet, but they're the greatest men that I've got. And when you criticize them, you're criticizing me because I put those men in the positions that they're in. God had to humble me some and help me to understand how he was working and for me to learn how to work with him. 
So yes, there's still, there's still, we're still in a red horse state and there's still men with a great sword that has power to hurt people. Not that they intentionally hurt, but they may not have wisdom. And I have to admit that I fit in, I, I fall in that category. I have failed people down through my ministry. I think I'm doing better now, but I have to admit the fact that, you know, I didn't always know how to treat people right. I thought I was doing right, but I wasn't doing right. I've had to gain more meekness, more lowliness, and I think God's helped me to have more wisdom. I'm having to learn how God thinks uh, about his people before I, I, I make a decision on how to deal with God's people. I have to be led of God and I have to learn how how's God feel about this. Anyway, so this two-horned beast finally is going to speak like a dragon. And uh, there's too many earmarks here that makes me see that the United States full f is, is, the, uh, is the nation that, that fits this prophecy of a, this two-horned beast that's going to speak like a dragon. And so <clears throat> uh, it'll set up a system. And uh, of course, there's 10 kings that will come behind that because there's gonna be an eighth head that's gonna be put into power once the mark of the beast. If you'll notice here, uh, let's talk a little bit about the image. Uh, down in the 14th verse, Revelation 13 says, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live, and he had power to give unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, I don't think that's talking about literally murdering or killing people, but I think they, their influence if, if you're not a part of the, and take the mark of the beast in the end of this world, you, won't, you will not be considered uh, having any influence whatsoever. And it's said, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their foreheads. I've said the hand is a picture of God's ministry, apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists. That's the hand. There's many of God's people that will, of ministers, called men of God that will take the mark of the beast before this is over with. And others will take it in their forehead, the doctrine, the thinking, the teachings. They will take these things in their forehead and in their mindset, in their thinking. Uh, I think you, also you can just be in the number of the name, which is, 666, he goes on here in here to say that unless you take this mark, you can't buy or sell. I'm, it's talking about the gospel. I'm selling right now. I hope you're buying. <laughs> but um, there'll come a day that it'll be against, it will be against the law to preach the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and great persecution will be upon God's ministry. Uh, because this religious world and this dragon system that's coming, that's forcing the mark of the beast on everyone is not going to understand it. They're going to think they're doing the right thing and they're going to reject all of the manifestation that God is going to show them just like the Jewish world rejected Jesus Christ and his ministry who worked under severe persecution. That will happen again. And in the end of this world, God, while all of these things are taking place, God will make up his bride, the remainder of it, out of this Gentile world, what he's going to bring about. That's going to transpire. So, <clears throat> and then he said, 
no man to buy or sell them. Verse 17, save he that hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. See, here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast for the number of the man and the number is 603 score six, 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 six. That's not talking about a tattoo or or some chip. I've heard, you know, we've heard all kinds of things, but it's just simply talking about, it's a body. It's a body of the beast system. The body of it is put together by man. The number of man is six. The spirit of it. It's the spirit of man. It's not the spirit of God that's building that. It's the spirit of man's ideology. And then the, and the soul of it, the thought, the, thought the, the doctrine of it, the teachings of it, body, soul, and spirit. The body of it, the doctrine of it, and the spirit of it is man. It's, it's developed out of man's building, man's ideology, and you can get in the number of that. Some people probably won't be real uh, analytical or won't be real studious and take the doctrine into their mind. They'll just take the spirit of it. They'll just join up with the spirit of it. See, before this is over with, the conglomeration of, of Christianity is going to come together it's going to come together and they're going to call it the healing of the body. And, and many people will be deceived by that because they will believe that the body of Christ is finally making peace and they're all coming together. Now it's become one body. It's going to be one body, but it's going to be the body of the beast. You know, you're going to have the body of Christ, the body of the beast, and you'll have the body of Israel. Uh, it's still it's still God's people. Uh, they may be away from God right now, but they are a tame olive branch that will be grafted back in before it's over with. Anyway, so that these things are going to transpire. Uh, so the the uh, the the mark. Let me, let me just mention something in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelations. Let me see how much time we got left here. Uh, okay, I've been talking 42 minutes, so I'm going to try to, you know, I'm trying to hold this within an hour every week. But anyway, uh, and if y'all still want me to continue down this line of talking, I'm, I'm willing to. Uh, I, I included in the description uh, of this broadcast, you know, my email address, or if you want to, if you want to post it in your comments, or if you want to let me know if you like, if you're, if you're interested in this study, well, you know, I'll, I'll probably try to continue it at least for maybe another week. Uh, hopefully we're going to get to all get back in church before long. They're talking about removing the restriction from four, from 10 people to 50 that still wouldn't put us back in church, but, uh, you know, it's moving in the right direction. So we'll see what's going to happen. Uh, here in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelations, and starting in the sixth verse, up until the sixth verse, it's dealing with the early, the early church, first fruits, those that were, that made up a portion of the bride back there. Here in the sixth chapter, he says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having an everlasting, the everlasting gospel. You ought to underline that in your Bible. That's what we're working towards is the everlasting gospel. See, if any of the gospel we have is not truth, it's not everlasting. We're working to get the absolute truth of the word of God and it being the everlasting gospel. This is talking about the restored church ministry, an angel flying in the midst of heaven, you know, finally getting in a heavenly condition, a ministry, an angel, a messenger, uh, having uh, the everlasting gospel to preach. 
See, it's showing an angel's a ministry. They're going to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, fear God. Here's three, three messages here that a restored church is going to put forth. First is to fear God and give him glory, give glory to him for the hour, that 15 year prophetical hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made them that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. See, do you remember, I, it, it's gonna take some of you older saints that's gonna remember this. Back when people feared God more. People were more God-minded. People, you could preach a simple evangelistic message of salvation and you didn't have to necessarily make an altar call. People would get out of their seats and run to the altars and fall prostrate, weeping and repenting to God because there was a fear of God that was planted in that generation of people. They needed God. They saw God work in, in the different revivals and the different moves of God down through the uh, Reformation period, especially down through Pentecost, the Pentecostal age of America. We're going to have to get back to fearing God and give him glory. He can't be a part-time God. He's going to have to be a part of our lives in a much greater way. Judgment's going to come. And when it does, it's going to require it's going to it's going to require more fear of God. That's the first message that this ministry, a restored ministry, is going to have enough power of God to show God's power, and the evil that's in this world is going to be strong enough that this world is going to be crying out for help, and those that have. Uh, an influence from God that God can reach. He's going to have a ministry that's going to reach them and cause them to respect and have an awe and a fear knowing that they need him. Then the next message he says in verse eight, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. <clears throat> Read the 18th chapter where God began to explain it in great detail how he said that an angel with a strong voice and a mighty voice would say, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins. He goes through a whole chapter showing how he's going to judge this religious, and I'm talking about Christianity, this religious system of Christianity that have missed God. And he's going to call his people out of that in a restored church called the body of Jesus Christ. Not just what everybody's calling the body. There's just one and it's connected and it's not a conglomeration of all kinds of groups that are not connected. <clears throat> the ministry will be 100% connected. Then there's another verse, verse nine. And the third angel, third messenger, followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture in the cup of his indignation, and he'll be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. That's the third message that 
that's going to be preaching strong against this Babylonian system. Come out of her, my people. It's going to take a restored church to do that. It's going to take men that have God has developed and chosen and empowered to do the work of the body of Christ in its restored state to accomplish the judgment of God, which first must uh, happen to the church, to the body, before we can't judge others till we've judged ourselves. We've got to become uh, righteous, more spiritual. We've got to get closer to God. And God, God is going to give the keys to some men. And he's going to back them up, just like he backed up the early apostles. So that's going to transpire. Now, this dragon system, two-horned beast I was talking to you about, that's going to set up the mark of the beast, which I read here to show you if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. See, there is a beast system, the sixth head, that was wounded unto death. It's going to become, it's going to become the eighth of the seven. And it is going to be elevated by the image of the beast that's going to be set up by this two-horned system, two-horned beast system that speaks as a dragon. That's coming. There's going to be a people of God, men of God, that are going to warn people, don't take that mark. Don't take it, or the wrath of God will get you before it's over with. Of course, uh, let me let me skip down here. <clears throat> uh let me read the 13th verse. I think it's an important verse. It said, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Notice that. Why would there be a blessing? Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. See, that's not necessarily talking about literal death, but to die out to sin, to die out to the Adamic nature. There is a blessed time for that. Why? From henceforth, from this point he's talking about, from therefore, now is a more blessed time to die out to your sins that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So that's what we're trying to do is enter into rest so where we stop doing our works or stop doing our will, but we enter into God's rest and do his will. Anyway, then look in the 14th verse. And I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man. Notice this cloud, by the way, is symbolic. See, people think Jesus is coming back in a literal cloudy day. I've tried to explain to people that, you know, if the, church, if, the, if the world is round and Jesus is up here and he comes in this part of the world, of course, the world is orbiting. It's orbiting the sun, but it's also, it's also, uh, What's the word I'm looking for that's causing it to turn? Um, you know, if the Lord comes into certain spots, how's the people down here on this side or even on the seed get outside going to see? He's not going to come down to cloud level. That's not what that's talking about. The cloud is, a, this is a prophetical cloud. It's a restored church. He, he, he beheld a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. That was in his ministry. And another angel came out of the temple and said, Thrust in your sickle, for the earth is ripe and ready to harvest. That's the harvest I'm talking about in the end of this world. The same way that that ministry back there harvested that world and made up a portion of God's bride, a portion of it will be made up down here. Anyway, 
so see, there's a lot that's got to transpire yet before the end of the Gentile world. This coronavirus is certainly not the end. It there, I, I would say God. I would say God's probably in the coronavirus. Uh, it's going to help the world's form. There's going to this. This is going to change some things in the world and in world governments. And it may set up part of what I'm saying about helping this two-horned beast become more empowered. Uh, we'll just have to watch and see what becomes of it. But just remember, the Bible says that God doeth nothing, but first he shows it to his prophets. So God's not going to catch his people, not his people asleep. He's always had a ministry that would reveal what God's doing. And God will, he will, if we will watch and we will pray and we'll stay, we'll keep our minds on the Lord, he will lead and direct his ministry and we will know and help God's people to know what he is doing and what he's going to do. And I'm telling you some things that God's going to do. I'm telling you some things he's doing right now. <clears throat> of course, when God gets through judging Babylon, this third message that I mentioned to you here, and he thrust in his sickle. He's also going to judge. There was another, uh, his, he's another reaping right here in the end of this chapter that is in, it, it's talking about the battle of Armageddon. God's going to judge this world. Uh, but he gives several details here. Of course, in the 15th chapter, he begins to talk about Look, let's read the first verse, Revelation 15. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw as it were the sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of gas having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou art ho only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple having seven plagues clothed in pure, in pure and white linen and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. See, these seven angels came out of the temple. They had uh, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen. That's righteousness and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke for the glory of God and for his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. It looks like that Finally, in God's final wrath of these seven vials being poured out, that the temple was closed and, and, and God had made up what he was going to make up in, in the bride. And no one would be able to, to enter into that perfect condition until this judgment took place. Uh, which is going to, this judgment is going to take place in, in the seven vials that's going to be poured out. I'm running out of time, so maybe we'll, I thought maybe we'd get into the seven vials this evening, but we'll, if we continue this next Thursday night at seven o'clock, we'll, we'll continue and work there. I, I hope that I'm trying to say a lot in a short period of time, and I hope that I'm saying things that is understandable enough that you, you know, can make sense of it. I, 
you know, I, I don't want to get to talking about something that's boring or has so much in it that, you know, no one can even latch on to. Brother Clyde Patton used to say, you know, <laughs> he was just an old country boy. He was talking about a wagon, a horse-drawn wagon. He said, you know, if you're preaching and nobody can get a, get, there's no handles where they can get on the rig, he'd say. You're not doing a very good job. Well, I understood what he's talking about because I grew up in the country. I grew up, my grandfather had, he, he didn't have a car or a pickup. He had horses and he had a wagon that he went everywhere in. I rode in that wagon with him as a little boy many times. And, you know, Brother Patton said, you need to have, you need to be going slow enough or have a way that people can get on the rig with you if they're going to go with you. And so I've always tried to be mindful of that. And I want to, you know, I want to, I want to try to explain at least my position of what I'm trying to get you to understand in a way that is at least understandable and reasonable enough that you can get on this rig. <laughs> anyway, God bless you all. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email me. My email address is on there. It's ifrsmith at aol.com. Feel free. Uh, you, also, you can get on our website. I have another email address on there you can email me by. You can listen to this post. I'll post it on my Facebook page when I when I close here. Uh, Brother Painter, who's in charge of our media booth, one of our associate pastors, he he will also uh, post this on our webpage and on YouTube. So uh, God bless you all. Thank you for uh, listening this evening. I want the saints and uh, I want everyone, Sister, um, Sister Layton, I saw you on there. God bless your heart. I miss you so much. We appreciate uh you being a part of our church and supporting it with your tithes and your offerings so much. Uh, you and your precious husband uh, and Sister Tansy and everyone that has been listening, Brother Faustin, I see you on there. God bless your heart. Different ones that has, has came on this evening. Uh, we, we just appreciate uh, having you and... Uh, it's, it's humbling to think that you would want to listen to what I've got to say, but on the other hand, I'm thankful uh, that I have friends such as you. Um, this Sunday, I will be back on in the broadcast at 1130 this Sunday morning, our regular time. And uh, I want to say to the saints in the uh, First Gospel Church, God bless your hearts. Stay faithful. I can't wait to have church service with you again. I hope it is very soon. Let's all pray for that. I'm looking forward to it in a great way. God bless you all. Have a good night. Uh, remember to pray for those that there's so many needs that we've mentioned them before. I won't take time tonight to mention them. Thank you again, Saints of First Gospel Church, for mailing in your tithes and offerings. You've been so faithful. We're so thankful for you. By the way, we're having a new awning installed, a drive through awning in our church. You know, the storm destroyed the old awning a year ago, and they are installing that. And by the time we have our next service, I think it'll be up there. God bless you all. Have a good night. Pray for me, and I'll pray for you.